Marge Madsen on August 22nd, 2016. Marge is going to give us a view of her memoirs. So Marge, take it away. Good morning. Uh, I was born on August the 8th, 1928, on a farm between Erling and Panama, Iowa, to John and Elizabeth Malone Smith. I was baptized in St. Mary's Catholic Church in Panama, Iowa. I attended grade school in a one-room country school and high school at St. Mary's in Portsmouth. Work on the farm where I grew up was hard, no modern conveniences. There was a terrible depression in the 30s and my dad's health began to fail. Doctors did not know what was wrong with him. In 1941, he was diagnosed with MS, and most people had no idea what that was. As his health declined, we kids all learned how to work and still have some fun. <coughs> Excuse me. I graduated from high school at age 16. I turned 17 in August of 1945, and soon after, I went to Harlan, Iowa to work. I was paid a straight wage which amounted to about 45 cents an hour. It was there that I met a great young man named Ray Madsen. He had just returned from Japan after serving in the Army in World War II. We were married on October the 9th, 1948 at St. Mary's Church in Portsmouth, Iowa and spent 65 years together before his death on October the 7th, 2013. We raised four daughters while living in Harlan, Iowa. In April of 1950, we bought our first home in, at 1308 Lincoln Avenue, two-bedroom prefab with a coal furnace. As time went on, we outgrew the house, so we built an addition on the back and installed new siding, windows, and awnings. We built new kitchen cabinets, put in a gas furnace, and a water heater. We did most of the work ourselves, with some help from family and friends. I always had a garden and canned lots of fruits and vegetables. I also sewed a lot, making draperies and curtains, and with four girls to dress, I made everything from pajamas to prom dresses and three-piece wool suits. While living in Harlan, I worked nights at the Maid Right, part-time at Farner's during Christmas and special sales events, and did filing and answered phones for a neighbor who was an insurance salesman. I was active in St. Anne's Guild, the Ladies' Society at St. Michael's Catholic Church. I served as secretary and was the ad chairman for the Mardi Gras that the church sponsored every year. We had to raise a lot of money to do that. I also worked at St. Michael's School Hot Lunch Program and at parish dinners, some of which were fundraisers and also at funeral dinners. In 1963, Ray was transferred to Nebraska City, Nebraska with Sig Company as their outside salesman. We all became and remain Cornhusker fans. I went to work full time in retail again and worked until we moved to Colorado. I helped out at church and in the schools in Nebraska City where the girls attended as I had done in Iowa. The girls were all active in school activities so that meant Ray and I were involved. I sold cheerleader and pep club outfits and costumes for school plays and musicals, and Ray built stage props. We did a lot of work on our home at 2001 Third Avenue in Nebraska City. We enjoyed our life no matter where we lived. Ray was always a happy guy. I'd say his glass was always two-thirds full. He could fix anything. He made a multitude of things and all with no pattern just a picture in his head. We had a lot of friends wherever we lived and most are gone now. We did a lot of dancing over the years and spent a lot of time with our siblings. If someone had a project and needed help, we were there. We all shared the work, the fun, and the food. The girls all grew up in Nebraska City and moved on with their lives. Ray and I moved to Fort Collins, Colorado in March of 2000 into a brand new house at 1344 Armsley Court. The new house meant more projects for Ray. He was always busy in the garage. 
In addition to wooden toys and furniture, he made many birdhouses with license plate roofs and 800 dustpans out of old license plates and wood. December 12, we decided to give up our home and move to assisted living in Fort Collins when Ray was diagnosed with cancer. He didn't complain, but we all knew he wasn't feeling good. <clears throat> our daughters are Betty, married to Mike Headley, Jane, married to Mitch Pereski, Mary Pitchler, and Jean, married to Jim Krakemeyer. I was preceded in death by my husband, my parents, three brothers, Michael, Jack, and Bill, two sisters, Mary Elizabeth and Rita, a son-in-law, Ken Pitchler, and a grandson, John Pitchler. Surviving besides the girls are four grandchildren, Brian Headley, Christina Went, Allison, and Nathan Krakemeyer, the sister-in-law in Council Bluffs, Iowa, which she is no longer alive, a brother-in-law, Lester Schmitz in Harlan, Iowa, and a sister-in-law, Frances Arnholtz in Arvada, Colorado. Many nieces, nephews, and friends. The early years. My first memories are from the 30s. We lived on a farm near Panama, Iowa. The weather was very hot and dry in the summer and very cold in the winter. In the summer, the ki we kids played in the dirt as the grass had died from lack of rain. Many wells in the area went dry, but we were lucky. Ours was fine. That fact meant that we had water that we had to pump and carry it by the bucket full to the garden to keep it alive so we would have something to eat the next winter. In the winter of 1936, the temperature didn't get above zero for a whole month, and the snow was so deep it covered the fences so we could walk right over the top of them. There were no modern conveniences. We had a pop bellied stove in the dining room for heat and a big black iron range in the kitchen. We burned corn cobs, wood, and coal, but not much because you had to buy that. We had kerosene lamps to see with at night, and all the water was carried in from the pump in the yard, and the dirty water carried out. In the summer, we often slept on the floor because it was cooler than those upstairs bedrooms. No air conditionings or fans. In the winter, we often heated a brick. and wrapped it up and put it in the bed to warm our feet. It, of course, was cold by morning. We had feather beds and lots of homemade quilts. On the farm we lived, all the farms we lived on were the same. No modern conveniences. And I can't forget the outhouse back, out back, with the Sears and Roebuck catalog. Hot and cold, wet or dry, that's what you used. There were always chores to do after school and before supper and then homework after supper by the lamplight. A lot of time, mom would be sitting at the sewing machine in the evening by the kerosene lamp. Hearing an airplane was rare. We would run out to see it. Now thousands fly every day. As I got a little older, there was more work to do. Learning to cook, butcher chickens, sew, wash clothes with lye soap and milk the cows. Milk had to be separated from the cream. The cream, the milk was fed to the calves and pigs and the cream was sold to a creamery. We churned butter from that cream and then you had buttermilk to drink or to cook with. The winter was the time to butcher a hog and a beef. The reason it was done then was so you could leave the butchered animal outside and it would freeze until you could cut it up. It took several days. We canned some and it was delicious. We cured ham and bacon, made pork sausage, and liver for breakfast. Yuck. We also rendered out the lard, and that's where the cracklings came from to make lye soap for laundry. The lard was used for baking and cooking, and it made great pie crust. In the summer, more work, planting and tending the garden, hatching baby chicks in the incubator, which was kept warm by a kerosene lamp. You had to take the egg out every day, turn them so the chicks wouldn't be crippled when they hatched. On into the summer, the small green oats and barley had to be cut with a binder, put the stalks in bundles. In the evenings, we went out and put those bundles into shocks so the grain would dry properly. There was a neighborhood threshing crew that moved from farm to farm. Everybody helped one another to thrash the grain. We had to feed that crew dinner and supper each day they were at our house. 
The food was fixed in the kitchen on that big stove heated with cobs and woods. <clears throat> Talk about hot. Now that's all done with combines, and if it takes a meal, the farmer takes the men to town. In the fall, it was time to pick corn by hand with a team of horses and a wagon. When it was time to shell the corn, you needed extra men again. That meant more cooking for Mom and her helpers. After the corn was shelled, a lot of the cobs went into the cob house, which over the next year would be carried into the house to be used in the stoves for heating and cooking. Corn by the ear was often fed to the pigs and horses, and then you had to pick those cobs up out of the pig pen and horse feed boxes and carry them to the house to burn. Dad and all the neighbors cut down dead trees, and we gathered anything that would burn for heat because in the 30s, no one could afford to buy coal. Mom also used to raise ducks, which she would butcher and sell at holiday time. I have no idea what she might have charged for them. The train depot agent always liked duck for his holiday meals, so he and my folks had a deal of some sort whereby he had fresh duck and we had coal. You got the coal that fell from the railroad boxcars for free. None of the farmhouses were insulated, so in the fall, Dad would bank straw up against the foundation to keep cold air from getting under the floor. Mom always had a lot of house plants. Dad made her a special stand, and it was always in front of the window. In the winter, you put newspaper or some kind of paper on the back side between the plants and the window to keep them from freezing. No storm windows. Sometimes the windows were covered on the outside. That's something that you couldn't see through, but it helped to keep the cold out. There was no clear plastic then. <clears throat> the last farm had a furnace but no blower, so the heat wasn't forced upstairs. My grandparents, mom's father and stepmother, lived in Omaha about 50 miles away. Mom always wanted to go there for grandpa's birthday in May and for Christmas. Leaving the livestock on the farm for a couple of days was not easy. Anyway, they had lights and running water. What a deal. The toilet had a big, big tank up on the wall and you pulled the chain to flush. It also had a curved staircase with a banister that was great for sliding until you got caught. Another thing, you could walk up and down the sidewalk. No mud and nobody bothered you. Grandma Malone made the best dinner rolls. She put a little sugar in them so they browned nicely and she didn't make them too big. Mom always took food along, canned goods, and at Christmas dressed poultry. One time she took a live rooster. Grandpa had a garage and no car, so the rooster lived there for some time on table scraps. I guess Grandpa made a pot of soup. Maybe he was reliving his days on the farm. My cousin's wife still lives on that farm four miles northwest of Panama, no, excuse me, Palmyra, Nebraska. It has been in the Malone family for over 120 years. One note of interest here. When Grandma Nora died in 1900, my mom was nine years old. She had older and younger siblings, seven children in all, and Grandpa had a bad crop that year with trying to farm and raise a family alone. He had borrowed money from the bank to put the crop in, which many farmers did. In the fall, when the crop was in, he paid the bank back when he could. But since the crops were no good, he couldn't pay the loan off. The banker said, then bring me the deed to your farm. Grandpa said he can't do that. It's not my name. He told the banker. It seems that Grandma had the money to buy the farm, and in her will she had stated that Grandpa could farm the land and take the proceeds as long as he lived. But when he died, the farm was to be sold, and the proceeds divided between her heirs only. Grandpa died in January of 1939, and so the farm was to be sold. Mom's brother Tom bought it, and a daughter-in-law of his still lives on the farm. I think Grandma was pretty sharp to have her will written that way, and by doing so, kept the banker from getting the farm. He did that to several farmers in the area, became a wealthy man. He owned a bank in Nebraska City, Nebraska, and a fine big house on First Avenue. I know some of the folks he ripped off. <clears throat> 